Howdy. There you go. It always works here at Texas A&M. Welcome to the Bush Library. My name is Warren Finch. I'm director of the Library Museum. Welcome to tonight's program. As you can see from the slide that's uh, up here tonight, we're going to talk about Texas A&M and the oil industry. Uh, if you have not seen our exhibit, the offshore drilling exhibit, please uh, encourage you to take a look at it uh, uh, tonight. It'll be here until February, so you have plenty of time. Uh, we have one of our partners here from Shell. They are our title sponsors. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have uh, Insco, Schlumberger, uh are also our sponsors. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to talk about some of the other programs that are coming up on our calendar. Our next issues forum is October 23rd, uh, again at 7 o'clock. And on that night, we're going to talk about offshore um, offshore safety, which uh, Charlie Williams. And then uh, we have a bunch of education programs coming up, a bunch of other programs. The foundation also has a number of programs. And please check our website. It's bushlibrary.tamu.edu. And it has a full calendar of everything that's coming up here at the uh, what we call the Bush Center. So bushlibrary.tamu.edu. Now, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our moderator tonight. Ignacio Gonzalez is business advisor for external affairs at Shell, supporting Shell's deep water business in the Americas. In this role, Ignacio develops a reputation management strategy for Shell's offshore oil and gas business in the Americas and directs a, a variety of communications approaches aimed at media, government, and through leaders communities, and environmental advocates. Ignacio is also responsible for crisis and incident response preparedness for Shell U.S. Gulf of Mexico operations. Prior to the current, his current role, Ignacio had supported every business unit ex at Shell, including upstream, downstream, renewables, and projects and technology. He has 20 years of experience in communications, public relations, reputation management, and corporate social responsibility. His unique experience at Shell and beyond gives him a comprehensive and integrated perspective on the subject of energy and the various challenges behind corporate policy and societal decisions about energy resources. He has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Government and History from University of Texas. <laughs> <clears throat> and currently lives in Houston, but I'm sure he's an Aggie at heart. <laughs> anyway, he's been a great partner for us, uh, instrumental in, uh, as, as have all our partners both in the industry and at Texas A&M putting to, uh, together this exhibit. So I welcome to the podium, Ignacio Gonzalez. Thanks so much, Warren, for that very kind introduction. Uh, on behalf of Shell, I want to thank uh, the Bush Museum and Library, uh, Texas A&M, our panelists, but really all of you guys for uh, for coming here tonight to uh, to hear more about this topic. Uh, I'm going to keep it short. I really want to focus on our panelists today. You're going to hear some great things from them, but uh, I just wanted to kind of set the stage because today are you know it's a really exciting and critical times for energy, and I think that's why many of you are here. Uh, my parents tell me that there was a time when you didn't really have to worry about energy. You just kind of, it just came to you and the industry produced it and you didn't really care where it came from. Uh, and you just used it, right, to create and create businesses and to do your thing, whatever that thing is. Uh, and, and that was pretty much it. But today it's entirely different. I mean, we're, we're, we're globally connected. We're very much aware of how our economies and societies are growing and placing demand on uh, what seem to be limited sources of energy. Uh, we all watch the price at the pump, right? And we really want affordable energy. Uh, we don't want to get into any global conflicts to get our energy. And we don't want energy to have any impact to our communities and to and we want it to coexist with the environment. So that, you know, that, that picture of what society expects uh, that we all expect and that vision is, you know, we're on that journey today. I think uh, nobody really disagrees with that vision at all. And we're on this journey towards that vision. And 
it's full of challenges that involve science, technology, you know, whether we can innovate ourselves out of those challenges. Uh, it involves politics, economics. Uh, it's totally multifaceted. I think pretty area, pretty pretty much every every area of study in the world has a, a role to play in you know how we realize the future of energy, right? And uh, and I think what's more important is that centers of knowledge like Texas A&M, they really are the ones who are going to really lead of how we do this because you know the knowledge that we all use to to produce energy comes from here. Uh, but really, the most important thing is that people who, who, who are going to become the, the, the solution for this are going to come through here, right? So how Texas A&M is setting a path to inspire people to uh, tackle this, on, on, you know, this challenge and to make people understand that this is a multifaceted challenge. It's going to be, uh, it's really, it lies here where we are today and uh, partly with the gentleman that you're going to hear from tonight. So I think what's pretty clear tonight, you know, as we kind of continue our journey towards this vision is that, you know, we need to meet demand for energy today and we need to develop multiple energy sources, hydrocarbons as well as renewables. Um, and there is great progress, I think. I think, you know, I may have a pretty rosy, optimistic picture, but there's great progress on renewables and I'm pretty confident that at some point, they're going to play a key role in meeting our needs. Uh, but the, you know, the truth of the matter is that oil and gas are going to continue to play a key role in how we power our, our world, ourselves, and our economies. And uh, so it's very important that we just understand, you know, how are we looking at oil and gas? What is the latest? How are we making oil and gas, you know, take place in this kind of mix of energy resources. So I'm kind of like you today. I'm here to learn about how Texas A&M, because I am a Longhorn. I know all about UT, but not a whole lot about A&M. Just kidding, I do. You're going to meet some really great uh, uh, people today. Some, uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with, uh, with, our, with our three uh, panelists. And they are individuals who, you know, spent, uh, who have a great experience in, in the industry and in academia. And they've sort of, you know, chosen to to work here at a and and to, to lend themselves and their knowledge to, to this effort, right? To, to provide energy and to do it in a responsible way. And I think that if we didn't have people like that, that really made the decision to, to do this, right? And to, and to do it with, uh, in, al in alignment with this vision, I think it'll be, it will be much harder to kind of meet our, our, our needs, what we are today. So enough about me and what I have to say. I just hope that you're really, as excited as I am to, to hear from them tonight and to have a really great discussion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, let each one of them, so we have Dr. Carlos Dengo, we have Dr. Akhil Duda Gupta, and Dr. Brad Clement. They're going to each one come up here and uh, tell us their presentation. And then uh, we're going to do a Q&A after all three of them uh, present. So please take notes. We really want to take uh, your questions. Uh, so take notes and write down your questions. And now when we all go through the... Uh, these three really great presentations will uh, will moderate a Q&A. Okay, so thank you so much again for being here. Uh, I'm really excited that you're here and uh, we're gonna hear from Dr. Carlos Dengo first. Let's see, am I on? Can you all hear? Good, I'm not gonna stand behind the podium so I'm just gonna come over here. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and thank you very much for being here today. By way of introduction, I am a Texas A&M graduate. I received my PhD degree in 1982 in geology. And after that, I went and worked for ExxonMobil for 30 years. I retired from ExxonMobil in 2012. And last year, Texas A&M approached me with the opportunity to be director of the Berg Hughes Center. I've been back on campus for nine months and very much looking forward to contributing further to the success of this university. The theme today is Texas A&M and the oil industry. And what I'm gonna do is set the framework that will hopefully put uh, in better context the two, the two speakers that follow. Let me just say that Texas A&M is today the great university it is in large part due to the contributions of the oil industry. Not only companies, but uh, to a large degree, many of our alumni that have so generously contributed back to the success of this university. I would also say that the oil industry has achieved 
what it has today in large part due to the leadership of many of Texas A&M graduates that have gone on to shape our industry. So if there's ever a good example of a symbiotic relationship, it's Texas A&M and the oil industry. To understand where this developed from, let's go back a little bit in our history. And in 1836, Mirabeau Lamar, who was then the second president of the Republic of Texas, urged the Texas Congress to appropriate public lands to support higher education. In 1839, Congress did so and set aside a little over 200,000 acres of land to endow a university, and most of this land is in West Texas in the Permian Basin. In 1858, the university endowment increased to 1 million acres, and the stipulation at the time was that all of the land had to be agricultural land, because the value was perceived to be in the grazing rights and the water royalty rights. In 1876, Texas A&M opened its doors <clears throat> for the first time, followed in 1883 by the University of Texas opening. At that time, the legislature decided to add a second 1.1 million acres to the university land endowment. The relationship between Texas A&M and industry actually has its roots in 1923, where on these university lands in the Permian Basin, oil was discovered in 1923 with a Santa Rita well, and then everybody realized what the potential value of the university lands might be at that time and in the future. In 1931, the Texas legislature uh, divides what's now called the Permanent University Fund that is the holder of these lands between UT and Texas A&M, and at that time they made a horrible decision. They gave two-thirds of it to UT and one-third of it to A&M. And finally, in 1984, the legislature voted to include all institutions in the University of Texas system and the Texas A&M University system in the public or in the permanent university fund. So what is the permanent university fund? It is these lands that the state endowed uh, to the two flagship institutions. It includes uh, revenue from grazing rights, from water royalties, from mineral leases, uh, oil and gas leases, from sulfur, and from oil and gas royalties, and ultimately from selling university lands. The value of the permanent university fund, or the principle of that cannot be touched, but the interest it generates can on behalf of both university systems. And that is called the available university fund. As of end of 2014, the available university fund had a market value of $17.2 billion two-thirds to UT, one-third to A&M. What's noticeable, though, is from June, oops, excuse me. From June of 2013, a year later to the end of August, uh, the value of that fund increased by 19%. Now, who here would not like to have a 19% return on your investment? Part, th two reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, the stock market uh, was was returning very well. But the second one, and the one I want to emphasize, is that a lot of that increase was largely due from gener gen uh, revenue generated by increased activity of the oil industry in the Permian Basin. And a good comparison, if you look at the 2010 revenue of the fund, $337 million, compared to a year or four years later, the revenue being $1.1 billion. And again, a lot of that is because of in increased industry activity on university lands. What the Permanent University Fund has allowed is for both the UT and A&M systems to be among the top 10 universities in the entire country with the largest university endowments. The only other public institution that makes this list is the University of Michigan. And I'm sure had in 1931 the state legislator made a more equitable decision <laughs> and split the permanent university fund by half, there wouldn't be so much separation between the UT and the A&M systems. To understand the relationship between the oil industry and A&M, one, one only needs to walk through and take a tour of the A&M campus. There are over a dozen, if not over 15, major buildings on this university that carry the name of our alums who, made, who had very successful careers in the oil and gas industry and who gave back 
to Texas A&M. And most of these buildings host our major academic departments. I don't have time to mention all of them. Dr. Dada Gupta will also show you some examples. But let me mention just a few to highlight the importance of this relationship. I'm going to start with the Michael Halbuti uh, Geoscience Building. This is currently where the Geology and Geophysics Department are housed. In 1979, this building was named after Michael Halbuti, who generously donated not only to refurbish the building, but to add a new wing. Michael Halbuti as was known universally as one of the most adventuresome wildcatters. I had the opportunity to know Halbuti throughout my career, and I listened to many of his speeches. And without fault, he only said, Throughout my career, I've gone broke twice, but I never gave up. That was his pioneering spirit to look for new sources of oil and gas. He received in 1931 a BS and an MS degrees in geology and petroleum engineering. And here is the key to success, the combination of geoscience knowledge with petroleum engineering. And he went on to be a very, very successful independent oil man. I have it on good sources that it was Hal Booty who personally convinced uh, President George Bush Sr. to establish his presidential library here on the A&M campus. Second one is Clayton Williams. The Alumni Center carries his name, which houses the Association of Former Students. Clady, as is known by his friends, and you can see this quote here by Barbara Bush, is quite the colorful man whose personality is bigger than the Permian Basin he hails from. He has been a very successful independent and oil and gas uh, explorer in addition to a businessman. He wasn't a geologist or an engineer. In fact, he's class of 54, received his degree in animal husbandry. He has been an enormous philanthropist to Texas A&M University. Not only you saw the building that carries its name, he continues to support us. And he continues to support us primarily through our students, offering opportunities for our students and looking at the possibilities or looking at the potential of our students to go into industry and continue to lead uh, industry into the future. The next I'd like to recognize is the Hughes family. And they have uh, contributed enormously to Texas A&M in many different ways. The last was in 2010, Dudley Hughes, who's shown here on the right, uh, was the main uh, contributor to rebuilding the military walkway, which is an icon on the Texas A&M campus. The Hughes are twins, Dudley and Dan Hughes, class of 51, and Dan Allen Hughes, class of 80. They are also the founders of the Burke Hughes Center, which, as I said, I am the director of. And they continue to support our programs and our university and they continue to put a lot of emphasis in developing that next generation of students that is going to go forward and lead the industry. The last person I want to mention is George Mitchell. And if you've been on the north end of campus, this is the George and Cynthia Woods Mitchell Institute for fundamental physics and, a fundamental physics and astronomy. George Mitchell is perhaps one of the most visionary uh, A&M graduates that we have had. He touched a number of things, not only having created the Physics and Astronomy Institute, but he created a lot of things that were really leading in our industry, as well as uh, facilitating our science. As quoted by one of his staff, Mitchell was a tenacious visionary, and I think that underestimates his contributions. But one of the things that George Mitchell single-handedly led and was the, re was the cause of is, oops, that today, oil is bigger in Texas. Texas is the biggest oil producer in the United States, 3.4 million barrels a day. Uh, 3.4 million barrels a day produced from Texas out of a total of 8.4 million barrels a day produced in the United States. You can see that on this graph where North Dakota and Texas today account for about 50% of all the oil produced in this country. What is more noticeable about this graph as you can see, this ramp up in production only just happened in the last three or four years. So why was Mitchell so influential? He recognized something that geologists had recognized and the, and the industry had recognized for decades, that there are these very tight rocks called shales that, if properly developed, could produce gas and oil in ways they, they never have. And 
Part of the genius of being creative is not necessarily inventing something new, but having the ability to bring things together that have already been recognized and invented to do something different. And that is what Mitchell did. He took the geologic concept that there must be oil and gas in these shale rocks, and he combined it with the technology that we now call extended horizontal reach drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And he tried hard. He initially started in the Fort Worth Basin, uh, in the Fort Worth Basin around Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, chasing the Barnett Shale. And after a lot of failures, he made it work. It didn't take industry very long to catch on. And within a few years, you can see what has happened all over North America, and it's going to extend into Mexico. All of these basins that are highlighted here today is where industry is pursuing what we call unconventional shale resources. This is not an evolution in developing energy resources. This is an absolute revolution. And the contributions led by Jordan Mitchell, one of our alums, has led to a total different energy outlook, not only for the United States, but for the entire world. And for the first time, thanks to these contributions, the United States is in a position, after many decades, of having the opportunity to be not only energy self-sufficient, but also perhaps an exporter of energy. You can see that the, the impact of, of these shale plays, if you look at this photograph from space, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, all of this trend that is highlighted here is the activity at night that you could see, both from the drilling and the production of what's called the Eagle Ford Shale Play, one of these unconventional plays that George Mitchell's leadership helped open. College Station is right here, and if you take a drive around the A&M campus, Brazos County, or surrounding counties, the one thing you're going to notice more and more every day are more drilling rigs. This is now here in our backyard, and we are very much needing to be part of that and will be. The Eagle Ford play uh, is perhaps the most significant, well, without perhaps, it is the most significant economic development to date in the state of Texas. By the end of 2014, industry will have invested in this Eagle Ford play area in South Texas and East Texas, approximately $100 billion. That makes it the single most important oil and gas development anywhere in the world. And it's here, around Texas A&M and around our backyard. So, because of the contributions of our alumni to look for new energy resources, because of the developments of these unconventional resources which are here in Texas, the future of oil is actually very bright. And as Ignacio said, that is important because oil will continue to be the most important energy source uh, humanity has for decades to come. Because of our relationship with the oil industry, that only continues to get better because researchers at A&M, as you will hear from the colleagues that follow, are contributing to solving industry's problems and are contributing to providing students that the industry needs. The future of Texas A&M also looks very bright and getting brighter every day as those lights get closer to campus. And because of this symbiotic relationship, Texas A&M is increasingly better positioned to meet its mission to the state of Texas. Thank you very much, and I'd like now to turn it over to Dr. Dadagupta. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Akhil Daragupta, and I'm the Associate Department Head of Petroleum Engineering at the Harold Hans Department of Petroleum Engineering at Texas A&M. Well, Carlos very nicely described the link between Texas A&M and oil. And towards the very end of his talk, let me just try to move this here. Um, he briefly mentioned about the unconventional resources and more specifically about the Eagle Ford shale play. So I'm going to pick up on that theme and I'm going to focus on the role of petroleum engineering and more specifically uh, the role of the Harold Vance the Department of Petroleum Engineering um, in this unconventional revolution. 
But before I go there, first some context. Now, here you can see that both in 2012 as well as in 2013, the oil production in the United States increased by about a million barrels per day. And just to put it in perspective, this is the largest yearly increase in oil production in the history of the country. And what is more remarkable here is where this growth in oil production is coming from. Well, it is coming from places like the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, or it's coming from the Eagle Fork Shale in South Texas. Now, these are the places we would not have thought of even 10, 15 years ago. And if you look at the Texas oil production over the last, I'd say, five to seven years, our oil production has tripled. And we haven't seen this kind of rate of growth in oil production since the early years of the 20th century. So what Carlos mentioned is very true, that in terms of oil and gas production in this country, we are indeed at a game-changing or historic time. Now, if you move to natural gas here, it's the same story. You know, United States now is the largest natural gas producer in the whole world. We have surplused Russia, and we are also, of course, the largest consumer of natural gas. But again, if you see where this production is coming from, well, it is largely coming from shale place. It's coming from the Marcella shale. It's coming from the Barnett shale. It's coming from the Haynesville shale. So the, shales, the shale resources are playing an incredible lo uh, role in our, um, in our energy sufficiency in this country. Now, if we look at the net impact of all this, it has largely been positive. You can see that our imports are down by almost 5 million barrels per day from the peak in 2005. And you can see that our CO2 emission is down to the level of 1994. And that's because we are gradually shifting from the coal-fired power plants to the natural gas-fired power plants. And also, as a society, we have become more energy efficient. Now, the natural question that comes to our mind, well, what are the forces that are driving these changes? Well, there are many. And I'm going to mention just a few here. The first is the improvement in drilling technology. So the gains in drilling efficiency has been a major factor behind this unconventional revolution that you are seeing. And here we are looking at the experience of an operator from East Texas, and you can see that over a period of about 10 years, the drilling time has been reduced from about 55 days to less than 15 days. Now, this is a huge part of the equation because we know that drilling is a major part of our expense. So gains in drilling efficiency has been one major factor here. The next one, well, you are, most of you are already familiar with this. It's the horizontal well with hydraulic fractures, multi-stage hydraulic fractures. And some of these horizontal wells can be about a mile or longer in the horizontal direction, and it can have up to 40 or more stages of fractures. So what we are trying to do here is basically we are trying to create this enormous surface area to make opening for the oil and gas to come out from this tight rock into the well bore. And, 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 and Carlos mentioned about the contribution of George Mitchell in that context. Well, as we carry out these hydraulic fractures, we can also image them using what's called the microseismic imaging. Now, this allows us to understand the growth and orientation of these fractures, and we also want to make sure that the fractures actually stay in the zone we intend them to stay. Well, there has also been tremendous development in subsurface modeling. Well, we can do this high-resolution flow simulation to understand what's called well drainage. That means how far is the influence of these wells as we are producing. And this allows us to space these wells optimally and so that we can minimize the surface footprint. And then the last one I want to talk about is basically the, the, the improvement in formation evaluation. So we have all these downhole tools that allows us to directly quantify the quality of hydrocarbons or the quantity of hydrocarbons in the subsurface. You know, these are like um, downhole gamma ray spectrometers that tells us what's called the total organic carbon. 
Now, all these are very impressive developments indeed, and these actually cover the major aspects of petroleum engineering that we cover in the Harold Vance Department of Petroleum Engineering. Now, these are drilling and well control, and most of you are familiar with the well control after the Macondo incident in the Gulf of Mexico. Production and well completion, reserve reservoir description and dynamics, formation evaluation and petrophysics, and reserves and economics. Now, in Harold Vance Department of Engineering, Petroleum Engineering will not only provide depth, but we also provide breadth in the sense that we provide specialization in all these areas. Now, I will not have time to go through the detailed history here, but we are actually the first petroleum engineering department in the state of Texas, and the two department heads who had very significant impact in our department are Bob Whiting and Doug Van Gotten. And both of them had about a 20-year tenure as department head, and they have shaped this department the way it is right now. <clears throat> well, where do we stand with respect to our peers? And that's the most important judge of how we are. Well, last time, <coughs> last time we were ranked, and this ranking is still valid, we are the number, number one undergraduate program in the country, and we are the number two graduate program in the country. We are also the largest graduate program, meaning that we give out the maximum number of masters and PhDs. And until very recently, we were actually the largest undergraduate program, but because we have taken a more cautionary approach to growth, now there are other places that have actually overtaken us. And if you look at our research funding, it's about nine million barrels, nine million dollars per year. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, but when you count on a par faculty basis, actually, the research dollars spent par faculty basis, we are way up there. We are right around the top in the College of Engineering. Here is our growth in the, um, in the undergraduate program. And not surprisingly, our growth has actually followed the pa pattern of Texas oil production. <laughs> and, and right now, we are right around at about 800 undergraduate students. And we want to keep it that way. Here is the petroleum engineering graduates in the United States. And you can see why we want to keep it that way. There was this big boom in mid 80s followed by a huge crash. And now you can see that there is a second boom coming up. And here we want to be cautious. We want to make sure that we just don't produce more graduates than the industry will need. But on the average, we want to maintain our share of about 10 to 15% of petroleum engineers in the country. Uh, faculty, <laughs> well, I'm not going to go through all these um, numbers here, uh, but of course the department is always known by its faculty, and we have an extremely accomplished group of faculty. And just to show what our faculty is made of, here I'm showing actually the, the, the awards that is given out by the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and it's a society that has about 100,000 plus um, oil industry professionals, and these awards are mostly given out for, uh, these are technical awards. And you can see what is remarkable here is that the number of awards received by the faculty in our department, is, it, it outnumbers our nearest competitor by more than a factor of two. That should make all of us very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we indeed have a very, very accomplished group of faculty in our department. And that's why we are ranked consistently number one or two. I'm just going to mention a couple very quickly. Ignacio, do I have like a few more minutes? You are at 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, three more minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the first one is uh, one from the past, John Calhoun, a uh, very remarkable individual. John passed away last year. And he's variously referred to as the best educator in Texas. And John was instrumental beh behind the formation of um, the NCAR, which is the Na National Center for Atmospheric Research. And more recently, uh, Steve Holditch graduated as, uh, uh, well, he retired as, uh, as the department head in 2012. And Steve has been a pioneer in many areas. And uh, recently he was inducted as one of the legends of hydraulic fracturing. And Steve has been doing hydraulic fracturing long before it became a household name, so in the mid-70s. So very, very remarkable individual and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering.
Our alumni, of course, we are extremely proud of our alumni. And as Carlos said, you just have to walk around the campus to see. There are 10 campus buildings which are named after our alumni. And we, this alumni, amongst them, there are more than 200 CEOs of major and independent oil companies, several National Academy members, and presidents of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. I'm going to just mention or profile a couple here. Tim Leach very remarkable individual who started Concho Resources starting from nothing into a 15 billion dollar company and it is now one of the fastest um, oil, oil and gas producing company in the Permian Basin and of course team has been a very big supporter of the College of Engineering here. John Bethencourt, John has been one of those who actually have moved up the corporate ladder, retired as senior vice president, executive vice president of Chevron and if you have been to MSC, there is this Debbie and John Bethencourt family ballroom there. And if you haven't seen it, you must check it out. It's really nice. It's very nice. And that was, of course, the John and Debbie's contribution. <laughs> Just a couple of international faculty, I mean, international alumni. They have done extremely well. We have this former Egyptian oil minister. <clears throat> we also have the current senior vice president of Parthamina, which is... Uh, the Indonesian National Oil Company, who actually happens to be one of my first PhD students. So, they are, so both the, our domestic as well as the international students have done extremely well. So I'll finish with a future outlook, and I'm on time now, Carlos. <laughs> you said I'll be late. <laughs> first of all, we are not running out of oil and gas anytime soon. You know, there is a famous quote that the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. <laughs> so similarly, the hydrocarbon age is not going to end because we'll run out of hydrocarbon. It will, if it ends, it will end because we find a better source, we find a cleaner source, we find a more effective source. <laughs> U.S. is rapidly heading towards energy independence. This is just absolutely amazing. We could not have thought about this 10 years ago, and, but that's the reality. The growth in oil and gas production is driven by unconventional resource development, and this has been a huge boon to the country. And it is estimated that we have over 22 billion barrels of unconventional oil and about 800 trillion cubic feet. I mean, this is just amazing numbers, and this has all, all have happened over the last 10 years, and, for, and with visions for people like uh, George Mitchell. Petroleum industry is a going, growing industry with lots of opportunity. It's a very high technology driven industry. Oftentimes that's not appreciated because you know, drilling a hole under 6,000 know, 6, feet of water and going down again a mile in the, in, in the ocean is, is a no small fit here. <laughs> and Tamu Petroleum Engineering Department will continue to supply the best petroleum engineers in the country. So we will continue to do our share. Thank you very much. And Brad, you are next. Thank you. My name is Brad Clement. I'm the director of the International Ocean Discovery Program here at Texas A&M. Um, and it's uh, largely because of A&M's um, in the world of scientific ocean drilling. Um, about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, A&M took the uh, bold step to take um, a, a research, a, a drilling exploration vessel um, and convert it into a scientific research facility for the international science community to access um, the sediments and rocks that lie beneath the seafloor. Um, we have operated that vessel. It was started out as a SEDCO BP-471 and it has been since renamed the Joides Resolution. And A&M has operated that vessel for the international science community since 1984. Um, just a little bit of bragging, since that time we have brought in over $1.2 billion uh, through Texas A&M in terms of federal expenditures. Um, and we've just received a new five-year award with a possibility for an extension for five more years, which will give us another $330 million to keep uh, providing this facility to our, our international colleagues. Um, we are very privileged to be part of a long tradition of uh, scientific ocean drilling. Uh, the program, oops, sorry, the program actually started back in uh, the 1950s with Project MOHO. There was an attempt to try to drill into the Earth's mantle um, from an ocean barge, basically the cusp one. Um, and this was an 
it, it, and they failed to reach the boho, but they, more importantly, established the technique of dynamically positioning a vessel on, at sea. So you could lock into a position, maintain your location, and, and drill and re repeatedly enter the same hole over and over again. Um, based on that success, the, the scientists of the world realized that there was a great opportunity to gain access to the sediments and rocks below the ocean floor. Um, and that led to a, a series of programs, the Deep Sea Drilling Project, which was run out of Scripps Institution of Oceanography from 1968 to 1983. And then since 1984, uh, A&M has been leading, leading, taking a leading role in the drilling program, offering the Geordies Resolution through these successive programs. And we're now into the uh, first year of the International Ocean Discovery Program. We like to joke that if you know of any international oceans that need discovering, <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to hear about them, but uh, we do a lot more than drilling, and we really wanted to try to come up with a name that would communicate to the, the broader community that we're not just about drilling, but we really are about discovering and making the point about how much there is yet to be discovered beneath the, beneath the seafloor. Um, it is uh, one of the world's largest, most successful, longest running international uh, scientific collaborations of all time. Uh, we have uh, shown here 24 country member countries who contribute significantly in both financial and intellectual capacities. Um, and we've, since the slide was made, we've added um, Israel and Poland to the mix as well. Um, and so it's a real honor to be able to work in such an international and dynamic uh, community. And uh, many of our international colleagues pass through a and very routinely, um, coming to sample our cores and meet with our scientists here just around the corner at 1000 Discovery Drive. So the Joides Resolution is a uh, dynamically positioned drill ship. Um, it has 12 thrusters that uh, op point in all different direct azimuthal directions. It can lock on to a, a site location um, and maintain its position as currents and winds uh, change. Um, it is designed to drill and core in very deep water. We just recently completed an expedition this summer where we were drilling in over four and a half kilometers of water. That's about 15 Empire State buildings stacked on top of each other. Um, we then went about a, a kilometer and a half into the rocks beneath that, into, through the sediments and into the hard rocks of the basement of the ocean crust. Um, the, we are uh, able to, once we make a hole, we can place a reentry cone at the bottom and re-enter that hole. So as the bit, bit starts to wear out, we can pull the drill string all the way up to the surface, um, and then we can go back in and take an 18-inch bit and find a you know, 12-foot diameter reentry cone that's four kilometers away. Um, that's about the distance from here to the Hilton, uh, and uh, it always amazes me that we're able to do that. And these days, it only takes, you know, maybe you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. The most recently, but uh, on a good day, it can, it can, we can re enter those holes pretty quickly uh, once we get the pipe down towards the bottom. Now, unlike our colleagues in the oil industry, we are not so interested in drilling as fast as we can, try to get as deep as we can to get to the resource targets, but we instead are interested in, in obtaining as complete a possible, as possible a sequence of the sediments and rocks um, beneath the seafloor, and we have a series, a series of different coring tools to do that. I won't go through the details of these, but these allow us to recover nearly mechanically undisturbed sequences of even very, very soft sediments in some cases. Uh, the cores are brought up here onto the, the, shown here on the catwalk of the, the rig floor, although the rig floor is back in this, I'll try not to hit the advance button, back here. The cores are come up in about nine and a half meter long segments, um, and they are then laid out and curated. They are then cut into a meter and a half long segments for, um, to ease, for ease of measurement through the shipboard laboratory systems. Um, the cores are eventually split in half longitudinally, um, and one half then becomes available for sampling for the shipboard scientists and scientists subsequently, and the other half is preserved as an archive record uh, for many years to come to let scientists come back and, and be able to describe and, and see the core um, before it's been sampled. The cores are then uh, processed through a shipboard laboratory stack. We have a seven-story laboratory stack on board with about $5 million worth of scientific equipment on board. It's our, our job at A&M here to keep all that equipment running. Um, and working. Um, the, the cores run through the laboratory stack in an assembly line type fashion, and it's a very interesting, unique scientific environment to work in because most laboratory scientists work off in their own lab, almost in a little silo alone, um, and don't interact with other scientists too much. And often, the only pressure they get is from a looming uh, grant proposal deadline or a publication deadline. And here you've got um, some of our, you know, 
pro expedition project managers cracking the whip. You know, if a, often a core might come up on deck every 10, I mean, every 20 to 30 minutes, and you've got a 10 meter core to process and make your measurements on in relatively rapid time so that you don't have a huge backlog of core following you up in the, in the core lab. Uh, the vessel is not only a floating laboratory, but it's also a floating university. On every two month long expedition, we, we uh, staff a crew, a scientific party of about 25 to 30 scientists from our member countries. Um, and so we have a very internationally diverse group of scientists on board. Um, and it's a very interesting and unique environment. I mean, it's a, it's a crucible of ideas. And these days, um, sci science often works serially, meaning that you, you might work and have a question and you might email your colleague halfway around the world, um, then you wait a couple of days for them to reply and then you think about it and then you go back. Um, on the ship, we actually force these 25 scientists to be live in a very small place and work on the same problem at exactly the same time. It can be a very intense environment, uh, but you've got the world's experts in the field uh, thinking about a problem at the same time, um, and it's a really powerful environment. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we um, traditionally staff about a third of our science party with graduate students, and we are um, uh, playing a very important role in training the next generation, not just of geoscientists and earth scientists, uh, but sort of politically, culturally, multinationally literate scientists who can function in, in that, that frame. Uh, once we finish with the cores on board, they are brought back to one of three repositories. This is a, a shot from the uh, repository that's right around the corner at 1000 Discovery Drive. Um, we have 110 kilometers of core stored um, in a facility that a and makes available for the international program. Uh, I like to uh, you know, brag that when you walk into this chilled refrigerated room, you're walking in a room that contains the past 160 million years of our planet's history. Um, and it's very much like I think that I get the feeling that you would, might have gotten when you walked into the library at Alexandria. So, I mean, it's, a, it's a very impressive, uh, impressive collection. Now, what did I do? I just turned something off. Okay. So the, um, I won't go through this, this long list. There, there are more accomplishments of the, of the overall program that I could possibly hope to list. Uh, but early on in the days, uh, the, the like six of the drilling program very conclusively demonstrated that seafloor spreading um, was, a vi was the viable hypothesis that explained the, the plate tectonic paradigm that we come now to frame our whole understanding of our, how our planet's planetary system works. Um, Drilling into the Mediterranean Sea uh, unexpectedly recovered massive deposits of salt. The only way to explain those deposits of salt uh, we came to understand was the fact that about five million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea completely dried up. Um, it not only did that once or twice, but it probably did that hundreds of times as the sea level dropped below the, the sill, the Straits of Gibraltar, and then sea, as sea level oscillated back and forth. The Mediterranean evidently flooded uh, repeatedly and dried repeatedly. Um, one of the more spectacular sections we have is the, uh, um, the section that contains the, the fallout uh, of an asteroid or meteorite impact that hit in the Yucatan Peninsula. And you can see the nice thick layer of debris that fell out from that and, and that impact occurs right at the layer at which uh, we can see uh, the mass extinction that were, is most famously known for the, uh, the die off of the dinosaurs. But that extinction also killed off about 95% of the marine species and the surface species in the oceans. Um, we have recovered an intact section of the upper, upper, upper part of the oceanic crust. This may not sound too spectacular to the average person, but you know, a lot of what we think about what makes up two-thirds of our planet's surface really is unknown, really. You've got to, until you get your hand on it and see it, it's, you, you have to remember that we're just sort of making, working on an, an assumption. Um, the drilling, the JR actually um, was, is well known for recovering the first samples of gas hydrates um, in, under in situ temperature and pressure. So the gas hydrates are these frozen molecules of methane and water um, that are found on, in vast deposits along the continental um, slope and margin. Um, and if we could figure out a way to unlock those, that could easily be the next big revolution in energy sources. Um, the next one I'll highlight is just that, that uh, we have learned that deep ocean waters flow vigorously through the, the, the ocean crust. Um, this has major implications for the way we think um, the ocean chemistry remains relatively stable through time. Um, and 
Uh, it also has possible implications for carbon sequestration as we realize some of those chemical reactions actually take carbonate out of the seawater and deposit it into the ocean crust. And then finally, I'll just highlight something that we really had no concept of 15 or 20 years ago, was that there's a huge amount of microbial life that lives beneath the seafloor. Um, some people estimate that one third of the total biomass of the planet um, exists in the form of microbes that are below the seafloor, something we had no clue about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, the most extreme example of this that always bother, or boggles my mind is that we have found a living microbe um, 1,000 meters below the seafloor and rocks that are 100 million years old. So fundamental questions about how did that microbe get there? Has it always been there? Is it a living fossil? Um, is, what is it eating? How is, where is it getting its energy? Um, major, major questions yet to be known. And this is truly a, a, a frontier that uh, we're on. So in addition to the academic science and the basic research, I'd like to highlight a couple of very successful uh, government academic industry partnerships. Um, so when the vessel is not being used for science, which these days is not 12 months a year, it's more like eight months a year, uh, we have occasionally, we have time to use the vessel for other opportunities. Um, I've just thrown three up here. The, the, uh, the, we have done two projects, uh, coring gas hydrates for the go government of Japan and for the Indian Oil and Natural Oil and Gas Company. Uh, an oil and natural gas company. Um, and then in 2012, most recently, we conducted a stratigraphic coring uh, project for a consortium of major oil, major energy companies, uh, and this was led by Shell. Um, and we recovered a, a, I'll have to just say this was somewhere in the far North Atlantic region. I can't say much about where we were, um, and I can't say too much more, except that the, the, the cores that we recovered, once again, showed great surprises and proved that some of those seismic stratigraphers who thought they knew what was at depth were, were not quite right. Um, and it has forced a major rethinking of the regional geology um, and particularly uh, rethinking of the source rock that was the, the basis for a lot of leases that had been taken. So I'll finish by talking about where we are now and where we're headed. Um, we are, have just, uh, early this year, we started an expedition um, in the South China Sea, uh, documenting the, the, the history of the opening of that ocean basin. Um, and uh, of course, this is an area where there are a lot of oil resources and a, that the history of that basin is of great interest to uh, both uh, for ba basic research purposes and for the oil industry. Um, we're just now completing the third of uh, th these expeditions on the Izu Moding Marianas uh, Arc System. Uh, these three expeditions, I'm pretty confident when we look back in five or six years, we're going to see mark this year as a, as a major milestone in our understanding of subduction processes. Uh, one of the missing links of plate, te plate tectonic theory is really how does subduction start? Uh, how does one plate start moving beneath another plate? Um, and, and these expeditions have been re remarkably successful. We're just about to come finish this expedition. They finished coring and logging just earlier this week. Um, and they're on their way into port into, into Taiwan. Uh, after that, we start operations in the, we'll spend about two years in the Indian Ocean, making a grand loop around the Indian Ocean. Um, and the first sequence of expeditions really is are, are a series that are addressing uh, the, the timing and evolution and history of the monsoon system. Uh, this is a climate system that delivers fresh water to about a billion uh, people on our planet. So about a, you know, a very significant population is affected by that system and we need to understand um, how it has varied in time so that we have, can inform ourselves about how it might vary into the future. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll close and I guess we'll move into the question and answer period. Right? Thank, thank you. <laughs> you guys gonna come up? <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. When, did you guys wanna come up to the stage for Q&A? Wow, that was really... Really great stuff. Okay, let's take a qu anybody have a question on the in the audience? Raise your hand, please. We have one here. And if you, I don't know if you, I don't think we have a mic, but just kind of make sure you speak up for your question so you can be heard. Can you explain a little more of the monsoon study? So the the monsoons are a system where you get uh, in the in the summer the the high Tibetan plateau gets very hot, and as the air starts to rise, then it sucks in water off of the ocean. And as that moisture-laden water moves up that slope to those higher elevations, it, cause it, it turns into precipitation. As it moves up to cooler elevations, it loses its ability to hold the moisture, and it starts to rain. Um, and so we would like to understand the evolution of that with time. And it's very much likely related to the mountain building effects when the Tibetan plateau started to rise. Thank you so much for that. Any, uh, another question? One over there, please. Yeah, 
Uh, I'm Abdul Kadir, student of uh, public administration. I have a question with regards to the new boom that we, we are seeing. Uh, how would that affect the renewables? Because I don't see any much much of the funding going to the renewables with the new boom. Because you know, if you can produce oil and gas literally cheap, then I mean, there is no incentive for us to go to the renewables. And secondly, how would the new boom influence the offshore drilling? Because that's substantially heavy on capex. So if you can produce cheap on offshore, so onshore, how, what's the whole point of going to the Thank you. That's a really good question. Do you want to take that, Carlos? Yeah, I, I think the uh, <clears throat> these unconventional resources that we've talked about that has really been this revolution has created some paucity in the development of renewables because all of a sudden the country realized <clears throat> that it has a very large, relatively cheap, and much cleaner than oil energy supply. That's not to say that renewables are not equally important because if you look at the energy outlook for the world and you project the energy demand 20, 30 years from now, which is about as best as anyone can do, the planet is going to need every ounce of energy it has. Oil will not be enough. So renewables, nuclear, what have you, uh, albeit a small contributor right now, will, will be increasingly more important. But I think the, the unconventionals has slowed that down somewhat. Uh, Relative to the offshore, it doesn't matter where you are as long as it's economic. That's the bottom line. If you can make money offshore and you can make money offshore, you're going to pursue every possible opportunity that's economic. Yeah, I mean, I think I just add to that. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I think we need a mix of all kinds of energy. I mean, and, and that would be a huge mistake if we slow down on renewables. And, and I don't think. Uh, uh, so, so I see a lot of this natural gas revolution as a bridging fuel, basically. So the natural gas is really, uh, you know, when the sun is not shining, when the wind is not blowing, you know, we need something, and the natural gas uh, is a huge source of bridging fuel. So down the road, um, I think we will use a mix of all kinds of energy. Um, so, uh, you know, if there is a temporary slowdown, uh, um, uh, but I, I think that's where, uh, you know, federal research money should come in, and I think there, there is a... Um, I, I, I think there is a feeling out there uh, that, that that slowing down renewable research would be a mistake, and, and I don't think it's going to happen. Great, thank you so much. I'll take another question. No, no questions for now. One, let's see. We'll take about the, the, the hand in the back. There's a mic right there for you if you can speak into the mic. Uh, I just wanted to ask the, the panel for for current students at Texas A&M. Well, what advice would you give uh, for people wanting to, to make a future impact on the industry? Thank you, that's a great question. I'll take that to all three of you. you want to... <laughs> go ahead. You, you want to go? Well, I'll, I'll be glad to start. The advice to make a future impact in the oil industry is the same as the advice to make a past impact in the oil industry. Do your science very well. Be well grounded in the fundamentals of whether it's your science, your engineering, or what field you have chosen. And then learn good leadership skills, learn to be a team player, good communication skills, and everything around what it is to, to be the whole person, not just your technical person. Those ingredients of success in the future will be no different than they've been in the past. You know, I mean, as engineers and scientists, and one of our biggest strengths is, uh, is the public trust. So I think, and as I, I will kind of uh, echo on what Carlos said, that you know, we have this huge boon out there in terms of unconventional resources. And even if there is the slightest lingering doubts in the mind of the people, we have to make sure that good engineering and science can take care of this. And, and we produce this in an environmental uh, in, in an environmentally sound way. Uh, you know, there are uh, issues, you know, people have been talking about, um, you know, potential groundwater pollution, induced seismicity. You know, these are all issues. As long as there is doubt in the public mind, I think there is nothing that the sound engineering and science cannot really take care of. And I think, and, and so this is a great area to be in and, and make a contribution. Dr. Clement, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I just say I'm struck when you look at these, the slides, the previous leaders in this field often are bringing 
points together from disparate, what appear to be disparate locations. So I wouldn't be afraid to follow um, your own interests, even if they don't seem to quite follow into the, the, the pigeonholes that maybe academia would like to put you in. So we, great things came when pe people study both engineering and geology. And I think combining those two together is a really, really wise move. Yeah, great question. I think I would add to that question. You know, what are what do you think are the key barriers for for people that you know to go into this field? And not just you know petroleum, but with, with energy and science in, in particular. So, what are the barriers, and what what can be done to get more students to join your your colleges? Oh, you were asking for all for all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. You can start this time. Well, you know, I'm right now, we, our, our big problem is capping the enrollment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so there is a huge interest, um, and, and we just have to make sure that we are being judicious not to take more than what the industry needs. Um, and I think, you know, um, as, as I said, the majority of us see this as a huge uh, boon. <clears throat> you know, it, it, it is not only making us uh, self-sufficient energy-wise, it's reducing our import. It's also reducing the CO2 emission. So, uh, so I think the message is out there, and, and we are getting more and more very bright youngsters coming to the program. And I just wish we could accommodate as many as we could, uh, as we want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Dada Gupta. I, I don't think there are really solid barriers, but I think every university, ours included, has to be careful how much do you grow, because at some point you dilute the quality of your program. But maybe there is a barrier uh, that we're facing now is I think this university, particularly, I'm going to speak for our department, has a faculty capacity that can take on more students than we currently are, but we're limited by the resources we have to fund those students. Because you want to bring, particularly in a graduate program, you want to bring in students that you can fund. And as well-funded as our departments are, uh, we continue to find that as a limitation. Let me give you a statistic that I found to be very sobering. Our department, like petroleum engineer, engineering, is growing in leaps and bounds as, as the, the largest growing department in our college. Uh, this past academic year, we had a little over 300 applicants into our graduate program. We accepted less than 10%. We could have accepted more had we had other funding sources that could have helped the students go through the program. So opportunities to fund more students I think is critical and perhaps it does present somewhat of a barrier today. Uh, I'm, I'm, your monsoon study kind of fascinates me. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna it's not mine, but <laughs> we're making it possible. <laughs> so is this going to... Well, as India moves north, will it go back that far to see how the monsoon changed? As, uh, it, it, these particular studies are not going to go that far back in time, uh, and partly because of their location, they're already so far north. Uh, but looking back over the last you know, 15 to 25, you know, 30 million years, and that's well after you know, India started to collide with, uh, with Asia. But certainly, Himalayas were. Uplifting, stop uplifting, right? Uh, there in the middle, question there? Yes, just like hydraulic fracturing and extended horizontal uh, wells work for the land base for new plays, do you see the same opportunity with managed pressure drilling and dual gradient drilling in the offshore industry with the ability to have longer completed reservoirs with less casing strengths? Uh, yeah, I, actually. You can drill much deeper with You're, you're absolutely right. You know, casing is one of the major part of the cost equation here, right? And, uh, and, and, and both dual gradient drilling, riserless drilling, or managed pressure drilling, you know, these are all areas that we are very actively working. And the whole idea is, um, yeah, is to do this, but do this uh, in a safe way um, and, and in an economic way, yes. Good question. We're totally geeking out on drilling over here. <laughs> Completions, <laughs> fracking in the Gulf of Mexico. Question back there. In your uh, finding proof of the asteroid in the Gulf of Mexico, yes. have you located the approximate area where it probably struck? And have you actually picked up core samples 
from it. So the, the drilling results actually were, uh, the, the found the fallout debris, where it was actually off the coast of uh, North Carolina on the Blake Outer Rise. But we have, through other mechanisms, located that the impact hit in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and it most, and there is evidence from looking at, you know, imaging below this, the this Earth's surface, you can see the, the buried impact structure. Um, it probably was particularly damaging because it hit what we think was a, a deposit of evaporite deposits, which or was a mineral that had a lot of sulfate in it. And so when it hit, it threw a lot of sulfur into the, into the upper stratosphere, and that probably was what helped black out the sun for so long. And we had a, essentially what you know, we refer to as a nuclear winter uh, for two or three years. So things that plants fell apart and then the food chain fell apart. Uh, and and uh, that seems to be the current understanding of what caused that extinction. So just to pick up a little bit more, Dr. Clement, on, on your research from the uh, ocean drilling program, I mean, tell us, you know, what are two to three impacts your research have on the thinking on energy? So whether it's now or way in the future, I mean, what are some couple, if, if somebody's in the audience here thinking about the future of energy and your research, what, what do you say to that? What, what should they think about based on your research? So the role of our the drilling research, uh, how it affects oil exploration. I mean, it's uh, you know there's so much there's so many places where understanding how continents have rifted apart, and that early rifting sequence seems to be a place where a lot of uh, hydrocarbon deposits first form and accumulate. Um, we've contributed in major ways to understanding how several rifted margins have have occurred and the timing and sequence of events. Um, looking at the South China Sea, just looking at the so much was unknown about the history of that basin. And you've got to understand those basics uh, of how that region, the geo regional geology, had developed. Um, and much of that's hidden below, below the oceans for us. So um, I think we've been shed a lot of light on regional geology, which then is critical for placing, going, figuring out where you could try to uh, look for more hydrocarbons. Great. Question there in the middle? I just want to add something to um, what Dr. Clement has just said. Correct. Well, Great, thank you for that. More questions? We have one in the back over there. For uh, Dr. Clement, uh, using your example of your South China Sea uh, research with Joyce, uh, are there international agreements or authorizations that one has to have ahead of time in order to do No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, you know, spent a great deal of my energy worrying about just doing that. I mean, it, it's a, uh, uh, so we are a basic research enterprise, and so we actually have to work through the U.S. Department of State to request permission to do research in anybody's waters. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's always a changing geopolitical environment, right? And, uh, and um, you know, things that we used to take for granted, we, we can't anymore. Um, so that is a big challenge. And it does seem that uh, we are doing more and more, there are more and more proposals to do science in territorial waters than there used to be. I mean, we used to do a lot of our work out in the open ocean, and there's much more interest in interesting places. Um, and, and the world has changed in how they apply the, the sort of the 200-mile limit. Um, the EZ and implications has, has changed. So uh, it's, it's, that's always a challenge. Great. You, sir, you had a question? What role has uh, 3D seismic played in the uh, development of the ship? Uh, limited, to be honest with you, because uh, 3D seismic has the most impact where you are defining a trap that has some shape and form to it, like a simple anticline. Uh, the shale plays, these shales are laid down horizontally and they extend for tens if not hundreds of miles. So the conventional use of 3D seismic has had to, had to adapt. So now the 3D seismic is being used to really get very high resolution data that we can actually process to get more of the physical property information of the rocks. So for example, uh, could, through the 3D seismic, could we learn more based on the rocks response of where 
it's more organic rich, i.e. more oil prone, or where the rocks might be, in a relative sense, perhaps more porous in some places than others. So, so the shift has, it's still very, very useful, uh, but, but the utility or the application of it has shifted somewhat. Exactly. Okay. Yes, a good way to put it, exactly. Thanks. Uh, one question I want to ask, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Datagupta, the, the, the public trust, and certainly not a day goes by that we don't hear about this boom we're talking about having environmental impacts. Uh, so the whole issue of you know hydraulic fra fracturing. So what are you know what are what are your thoughts on you know how do you see those those challenges and the need to get you know that right? So from an academic perspective, what are you doing to tackle those? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, um, you know, you know, as I said, we always have to be vigilant and cautious. But having said that, uh, there are a couple of things. You know, there was a recent study from National Academy of Engineering about. Uh, induced seismicity and there is you know the chance of uh, hydraulic fracturing causing any kind of uh, significant seismicity the conclusion was absolutely remote now it does cause what we call micro seismic events and i showed that that's what we use to actually map the fractures to see that they are in the right zone um, so and, and this just to give you an idea these micro seismic events if you look at the magnitude of that you know that would be like you know, dropping a gallon of uh, water from your desk to the ground. So that's the kind of seismic event we are talking about. So, but, but something that we always need to look at. And, and the other is, you know, the other issue about groundwater pollution, as you mentioned, is, you know, typically in the North America, the shale formations are 7,000 feet or deeper. So there is at least a separation of a mile or more between the groundwater aquifer, fresh aquifer, and the shale formations. So the chance for this frac fluid to migrate and, and pollute the groundwater uh, or for methane to migrate is, is, is very, very remote. Uh, the, the, the critical issue here is, of course, well construction. We've got to make sure that the casing is well cemented into the formation. The cement is tested using cement bond logs. We do pressure testing. So as long as we do this right, and this is nothing that we cannot do with sound engineering, um, and, 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 and you know, there are, uh, when it comes to well construction and well bore integrity, there are state and federal agencies that regulate that. So um, this is not something that, um, you know, I mean, just to, you know, I, I'll say this, that, you know, if you look at, in the United States, we have done more than a million hydraulic fractures now. Now, um, and there, there may be anecdotes, but there is really no documented evidence of groundwater pollution from fracking. You know, I mean, there is more chance of a surface spill and polluting the groundwater. Now, if you're in the pharmaceutical industry and if you're doing a drug testing, you know, a million to none would be considered a stupendous success. <laughs> but but uh, so it is, uh, it's something to be, to be careful about, but I don't think it is a concern. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation, it's a very excellent. Um, so my background is not in oil and gas, so this has been great for me to learn about lots of this. So my question is, for people like me who have a background in geography, and GIS, and computer science, what opportunities do you see for bringing their research expertise from our disciplines to help move the oil and gas industry forward? You want to take? I mean, it's huge. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question, as you and I talked about. We're in love with GIS nowadays. <laughs> as you and I talked about uh, not long ago, I mean, everything that the oil and gas industry depends on positioning everything correctly. Uh, so whether you are positioning a seismic survey, a drill well, a pipeline, what have you, everything has to be positioned correctly. So GIS plays an enormous role in that part of the industry. The other part where GIS, I think, is playing an ever-increasing role is in being able to relate spatially different kinds of data sets. So you can overlay a topographic map with a pipeline map with what have you as an example, or you can overlay different rock formations on topography, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and I think those, tool, those tools are increasing in sophistication. And I think industry has a big appetite to see, okay, what else can they get from the, from the GIS uh, science that would help them better visualize the subsurface as well as continue to do their operations safely. Yeah, I mean, you know, oil industry is one of the largest users of super supercomputers. So if you are a 
computer science major, you have just tremendous opportunity in the computational side of things. <clears throat> yep. Yes, sir. Uh, in the in the uh, hydraulic uh, 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 fracking system, they're using enormous amounts of good fresh water to frack these wells. Uh, they're pumping off, or they're getting out of the chalk wells all this disposable salt water. Uh, it, what are the reasons why this salt water can't be used to frack uh, these Eagleford wells? And is it not economically feasible to clean up this salt water so they can use it, so they so they uh, reduce the amount of good fresh potable water, you know, that uh, can be used for many other purposes? I go or you want to go? <laughs> Why don't you go? That's <laughs> a very good question, actually. And, and, you know, water usage is a concern, and it's being more, uh, you know, the produced water is being reused. At least about 30% of the produced water now are actually being used to uh, frack new wells. And if you go to the Marcellus uh, Shale, for example, if you're talking about Pennsylvania, so there almost 90% of the produced water is being used to frack new wells. So, and then the use of brackish water, for example. Um, so, so these are all issues that are being addressed. And, and, and water usage is a huge concern, particularly given the water situation in Texas, I think. Uh, um, and, and, and I think the industry is working, we are working. And as I said, we are up to about 30% in terms of reusage of the produced water, but it got to be more. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah, great question. I think water issues are they're going to, somebody in this room or in future generations is going to crack that and solve that. Yes, sir? Well, it brings to mind, uh, we're in the salt water disposal business. I mean, what are you all looking at that as far as studies on that? I mean, we're getting a lot of heat because of the fact that the salt water being produced and being a contaminant and then taking in flow back water and produce water. So uh, have you all looked at any studies on that recently? In terms of using, using the, them, yes. using right. that. Back you know, right now, just it's uneconomical right now to take the salt and to make it where it's uh, producible. Here yes. Yes, and, and we, we are, you know, we are, I mean, we have, um, you know, in terms of separation, you know, looking at membrane separation, looking at, um, you know, forward and reverse osmosis in order to try to clean up some of this and try to reuse. You know, right now a lot of it is basically mixed up with fresh water and re-injected. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, th this is an ongoing thing. And, uh, you know, as I said, it took us a bit of time in the Marcellus to get to almost like 90 to 100 percent of reuse, right? So here, I think it will take a little bit of time, I think, before we get there. But, but water usage is absolutely a concern, yes. So we're going to, we're running out of time for questions here, but we're definitely going to uh, go to the, uh, to uh, have our reception. And you're welcome to talk to the, uh, to the panelists there. Just, uh, so I just want to close it up with one question from, from the moderator. So I'm going to give you an opportunity just to, again, to pitch what you're doing uh, for this audience to either help you or get more involved or to <coughs> join your department. So for each one of you, you know, what's your holy grail? What are you hoping to, to discover that you don't know now that you are striving for and dreaming about and that you wish your, your students and your faculty would help you do it? And we'll start with, uh, with Carlos. Well, our, our center is uh, petroleum and sedimentary systems, which is very broad and can cover a range of, of anything from pure science to very practical questions. But our mission is to work with industry. So we have to find problems that are relevant in our science and engineering uh, that is good academic scholarly research that are pertinent to industry. Uh, the bottom line in that sense would be, can we produce research in a number of resource types that would help uh, industry accomplish the one thing that industry wants to accomplish, produce more and spend less. The other thing is we have a mission uh, to the university and to the state, which is the educational mission. And by virtue of how we're setting ourselves up and the strengths of our departments, I mean, our mission is to generate the next uh, set of, set of uh, leaders and scientists and engineers that are going to continue building the industry in the future. And I think A&M, as you saw from my earlier talks, and again, I say walk around campus, uh, A&M has an outstanding leadership position in graduating students that have really made a difference in industry. 
Excellent. Thank you. Akhil, want to go next? Um, well, Your holy grail. <laughs> well, my message is simple, actually. Um, you know, we are number one department in, in the nation, if not in the, in the world. Like, so if you have a, um, a, a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter who is inter interested in the energy industry, send them our way. Ask them to talk to us. You know, this is, an, this is a growing industry that gives us tremendous opportunity. And we have this game-changing situation in the United States. So, so, so we are always looking for, uh, you know, bright, energetic people. Um, and, and, you know, you have seen our alumni, they have gone out and made a difference, and we are always looking more of those. So, so my holy grail is to be like a Kiel's <laughs> department. <laughs> Great, thank you. Brett? Well, I, you know, I feel very fortunate to be part of a program that is really driven by basic exploration and uh, the thrill of new discovery. And I think the holy grail we would have is to try to transmit that thrill to the students at A&M. Uh, by engaging them more directly with our program um, and, and helping them understand what a real thrill it is to be the first person to learn something for the very first time. Um, and if you can couple that together with the, the international collaboration and training that comes with working our program, I, it's a marvelous opportunity and I, you know, we are working very hard to sort of better engage ourselves so there's a, a more continuous flow of ideas and energy between us and the academic departments on campus. Great, thank you. Y'all give it a hand for our panelists. And please uh, join us for the, uh, the reception. We can uh, chat some more. Uh, Warren, any, any closing remarks? We're, we're done? Well done. Please join. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming.